And thanks for coming along tonight um, to hear about this fantastic new book, Charge, uh, here, um, which is written by Morag Livingston and Matt Foote. Um, the book which investigates modern day policing and tactics used by the police and the state to suppress protests and dissent possibly couldn't have been written at a better time with all the recent um, um, laws and legislations that the, uh, that the government are, are hoping to pass and have passed. Um, so it's a really a timely um, release for this book. Um, like I said, my name is Joe Rowling. I'm going to be chairing tonight's discussion. I've been an activist since I was at, at school. Uh, in my teenage years, I've been heavily involved in the anti-fascist movement. Um, I've been a trade unionist ever since I started work. And I'm lucky enough now to work for Unite in Unite's organising and leverage department. And I'm also one of the founding members of the Orgreave Truth and Justice campaign. Uh, the authors of the book are Morag Livingston. And Morag's an award-winning documentary filmmaker. Uh, she's a writer and she's an internationally published author. She's also co-author of two best-selling narrative non-fiction books, Hackney Child and Tainted Love. She's a lecturer and teacher in areas of photojournalism and the moving image and storytelling. <laughs> it's a great introduction, that one. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, Matt is a criminal defence solicitor specialising in representing protests and victims of miscarriage of justice. As a campaigning lawyer, he co-founded Justice Alliance to protect legal aid and ASBO Concern. He has written for The Guardian and also the London Review of Books. Um, the format of tonight's meeting is going to be a discussion um, for the first sort of half of the meeting between us three. And then at the end of the meeting, uh, we're going to have a, a good 20 minutes or so for people to ask questions, as Catherine said. Um, so everyone's going to be able to take part uh, uh, and feed in, feed in their thoughts. Um, so to kick off tonight's discussion, I thought we'd start off by asking um, uh, uh, Morag uh, um, why uh, she's written the book and can she explain why the book started when it does in uh, 1983? Sure, thank you. Um, well, when I was making, I made a documentary a few years ago and in, when making that, there was much um, discussion from um, both miners and people at Wapping and the Wapping dispute of 87 um, about this, police tactics manual that had come to light during the 1985 um, um, uh, court case against some miners for riot. And I'd heard a lot about this and uh, it piqued my curiosity, so I went looking, um, found some pages in the parliamentary library that had been put there by Tony Benn and spoke to a barrister um, about that. Um, and she explained the significance of this manual in that it was set out to incapacitate um, protesters just for being there. Um, you know, so there had been a shift. So, you know, curiosity on that. And then Matt and I started speaking about this and, and he came up with the idea of looking at protests across 40 years of protests. So the reason it starts in 1983 um, is because the manual was devised after the Brixton riots um, and UK wide riots of 1981. Mm. And Lord Scarman had um, said that we should have much more community policing after his review. They were the conclusions of his review. The Home Secretary at the time, Willie Whitelaw, agreed with that in public. But behind closed doors, they had a different plan. And they developed this 500 page manual, which included paramilitary policing um, or tactics. Um, various tactics um, right across the board. And they were applied and the, the manual was published in 1983. But there's a couple of things about this manual. Um, it was only um, designed for senior police officers, so those of the Association of Chief Police Officers, um, and also it didn't ever get parliamentary scrutiny. Now, Gareth um, Pierce, who was one of the solicitors involved in the Orgreave uh, trial of 1985, she wrote an article after the, the court case collapsed and um, it collapsed for various reasons, but the court case collapsed and all the miners were acquitted, which led to all the other miners who'd been charged with riot, uh, their cases falling away. She prophesied that the police had changed the law behind closed doors and were acting upon it. Um, so 
one of the other things that the, the barrister that I spoke to told me about was that Willie Whitelaw had been involved in the creation of this manual. It wasn't just a police thing, as it is kind of described today. It's still described as a police document. And what we've uncovered is that how to the extent to which the Home Office were involved in both the creation and the development of that. And the book maps follows that as a thread, how, how the handbook um, develops over time. Yeah, one of, one of the things I really enjoyed about reading it um, myself is that it is really sort of contemporary. So, you know, as the chapters, not maybe not in 1983, but as the chapters move on <laughs> to the <laughs> 90s, at least, um, you know, you, you, you know, you were there at some of the protests. And I'm sure some of the people on the call tonight will have been at them protests as well. And so to understand the sort of significance and how, how police tactics have developed over the last 40 years is, is really interesting. But we all know you know that police violence isn't didn't start in 1983 of course it's gone back you know decades um but yeah one of the real yeah but it was, i mean it was for the difference in 83 years it was formalized and it was put into a manual yeah of course you know, you know tactics yeah. that had been used before had been are now sanctioned behind government without any parliamentary look see which comes through really clearly in, in the book definitely yeah definitely um sort of touching on that then um matt um I'm guessing the books, um, you know, primarily sort of aimed at, at, at activists so they can understand how policing tactics have developed. Is, is was that was that your intention, or do you think that the books got an appeal to a wider audience? Uh, I mean, one of I think there are three audiences. The, the, one of the audiences we we uh, that you come across is on the on the new movements that have happened in with Extinction Rebellion and Black Lives Matter. You have a lot of um, of young people coming into protests for the first time. Mm. Um, and sometimes when you come into a movement, you think you're the first person <laughs> who's ever experienced uh, police violence. I think that's the sort of natural order of things. You think, and there tends to be that sort of view from what you can see. And so the book is partly written for the for those people to see that this is this sort of process has gone on for years and so that they understand their history of what the police have been up to before and the echoes of the behaviour today. There's always differences, but it's really important, I think, to understand the history in order to, to see that this is not a one-off or whatever, that there's a, there's a process here that's been going on. The, the other part of the audience is sort of what you mentioned, Joe, is that, that there'll be lots of... I mean, there were 200,000 people on the poll tax protest, uh, 60,000 people at Welling. Some of these protests are very big and the protests can be very confusing for people on the day and the fallout as to exactly what happens because you can't see exactly what goes on some of the times and because the narrative that comes out from the police uh, almost always distorts the truth. Um, and so it's written, we've had the benefit, uh, Morig and I, of looking at stuff from the National Archive, freedom of information um, and, and stuff that's been written since to be able to piece together a more forensic investigation of actually what happened on each of these protests, you know, what the, what the police and the state say has happened, what actually happened. And I think it will be very, I hope that people will find it very revealing, uh, telling, them, telling people who are on these protests stuff that they didn't know at the time mm. that has since come to light. And the last audience, I think, is for people who haven't been on these protests at all, but are interested in the social history of, of protests and movements about the environment or racism or uh, war or whatever, whatever it is. And, and, and that the actual stories themselves are very important. People coming together as a collective to try and change something or stop something uh, and what happens to those people. Because the, the eyewitnesses are absolutely central to this book, without the witnesses that gave us time and told their stories, there is there is no life to the book. They bring it to, alive, and I think the stories are are very powerful and compelling in terms of what human beings have, have suffered um, at the hands of often of a of a police baton through through these different through these four these four decades in particular, as Morag says, after the state secrecy or the home home office secret, secretly. Uh, brought in uh, 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 guidelines and rules that, that nobody else knew existed, apart from uh, the very small collective of uh, chief officers and the people at the very top of the home of the home office. 
I, I really enjoyed um, sort of watching how the police and, and the state have, have changed their tactics of, as they've learned from sort of mass mobilizations as a, as an activist, I think that's really important. We learn them lessons and sometimes, you know, in the movement, I know that's quite a wide uh, word these days, but we keep repeating the same mistakes and it's good to learn. You know, we need to learn just as as, as much as the state does, I, I think. Um, and on that theme then, um, um, going back to the manual, uh, Morag, um, would you like to sort of give us a bit more information about that? When was it first used? And has, has that developed as well as time's gone on? Sure, yeah. So the, the police took their chance at the end of 1983. So it was published in May 1983. And then at the end of the 1983, there was a print workers dispute in Warrington uh, in the northeast of England. And, and that's the first time that trade unionists um, saw the, the police and these new tactics. So at Warrington, they used kind of a pincer movement to split the crowd. And then they sent in the snatch squads um, and pulled people out and used their truncheons against them there. Um, but even more shockingly, later on at night, once a lot of the press had gone home, the police um, shouted to the rest of the media to turn off their lights. Um, and then that's when the, the um, police really went in on foot, but also behind um, kind of the, the plant where the printing of the newspapers was being done, they then drove um, Land Rovers into a crowd of static protesters. And that is a, a tactic which is sanctioned in the manual. So that was the first time it was used. Obviously, uh, trade unionists at the time just, you know, they didn't expect any of that to be happening. So it was a considerable shock um, to them. The second time it was really used was during the 1984 year long miners' strike. Um, they introduced dogs and horses kind of around about May um, 1984 um, and into the miners' strike. But at, at the Orgreave, what we call the Battle of Orgreave, which 6,000 policemen met 6,000 protesters and I think 50-something 50, 50 dogs and 80-something horses. Um, and that, that um, um, protest, they used short shields and batons together for the very first time. And indeed, at the Orbury trial later on, a, um, the chief, in, the person in charge, ACC Clement, um, admitted that they had been, the police had been told to draw their truncheons. Um, another officer also confirmed that horses um, and the short shields and batons were designed to terrify protesters and that they could be incapacitated just for being there. And this is what was the so-called normal policing um, um, or how they had redefined normal policing. So they were the first two kind of major times. And then over time, things have developed. We still see horses today used in exactly the same way. Um, we still see dogs. Um, and interestingly, dogs, when they were developing the manual, were highlighted as something that should not be used at protest, but should only be used to protect buildings. And they ran roughshod over that almost immediately at Orgreave. Um, and then in kind of 19, May 19, no, sorry, May 2001, they even went beyond the manual um, and created um, what we now, what we know as kettling today, which is different from containment. Containment would be police around the edge of the field or at the end of a street, but kettling is where they actually start, they hold you for a long time, for seven hours or so, and squeeze in. So they went, even went beyond the manual, they're so emboldened. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit more about how they became emboldened. Um, but a lot of what we see today, um, BLM um, and um, XR and at uh, the student protests, um, fee protests, were originally devised from the manual. They're still there. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm going to touch on Orgreave quickly, obviously, with, uh, with my involvement in the Orgreave campaign. Um, but, you know, in, in, in the campaign, we've always said that, you know, that the government were really heavily involved in the miners' strike right, right, from, right from the start. And, you know, a lot of us also argue the fact that they wanted revenge from what had happened in the 70s with Salt Lake Gate, and, you know, the militant sort of trade union movement in the 70s was responsible for getting people a decent standard of living, good wages, et cetera. And if we wanted to see, you know, the outcome of what's happened today with, you know, weakened trade unions, neoliberal um, uh, capitalism and, you know, zero hours contracts, all, all the rest of it, you could really sort of tie that right back to the miners' strike, yeah. I would argue. 
So um, when you've been doing your investigations, um, how much um, have you been able to sort of prove the government's involvement in, in that? If, well, if that's the right words to, to use, I know that's um, quite, can be quite controversial. Yeah, so, so Salt Lake Gate actually comes up a lot in the, in the government papers. So as Matt said, we, we had access to a certain number of files in the National Archive. The Home Office has still retained a lot of the files. So considering what we've managed to piece together from those files, um, you wonder what else is there yeah. on top of that. Um, hence, you know, the great need for an inquiry into Aubrey, or one of the great needs. But what we've shown is that, or what we found and pieced together, is that the, the miners' strike, as many people have always thought or assumed, was pre-planned. So it was pre-planned um, in 1980, from 1979, uh, Thatcher instigated a review of how to um, you know, beat the miners and how to win a miners' strike. And in 1981, they took the decision to step back from a pay um, claim that the miners had made because the government weren't ready. They hadn't built up enough coal stocks. And, in, and at that time, they spoke about the importance of the Nottingham area, which, as we know, a lot of those mines continue to work during the strike. Um, and they spoke about the importance of those central areas and keeping those mines open in order for the government and the police to continue the, their um, continue the strike and, and you know try and beat the miners and the militants of the NUM as they call them. Um, so that's the first one is that you know we've managed to show that the government did plan this, they were involved from the start, but not only that, all the way through the strike, you know, Margaret Thatcher ran a meeting which was every two days, which Orwellian uh, name is the MISC 101, and she even chaired that meeting. And often at that meeting with the, the rest of her cabinet, you know, she would express her um, disdain or disgruntlement at that the police weren't doing enough, that they needed yeah. to do more, that they need to increase the charges against people. Um, so, there, so there was all of that. So she was definitely at the core. In terms of intelligence, all the intelligence that was gathered um, went through uh, an office, if you like, called um, the National Reporting Centre, which publicly, even to this day, is said to be um, a centre that just coordinates police and moves them around. But actually the files show us that it was used for intelligence gathering as well. And then they created a separate intelligence gathering area who, which the Home Secretary uh, he he asked he gave them an objective to find um, uh, criminality amongst the senior people in the NUM in order that they could be charged and held examples of. Um, so you know all the way through um, you know the increase in charging, the amount of intelligence that was being gathered against the miners all was fed back to to Margaret Thatcher, and that alone I think is enough <laughs> to get. Um, uh, an inquiry and indeed um, Home Secretary when the Orgreave campaign was turned down on the 31st of October, I can't remember what year Joe, but you'll you'll know. 2016. <laughs> you go to 16. Uh, she was later heard at a dinner party saying that you know one of the reasons that it had been turned down is because it would sully Margaret Thatcher's memory um, mm. and just from the files that we've seen as I say they've not even <clears throat> released um, you know we've managed to put that together. I don't think I've missed anything Matt if you knew. No, that was really, really uh, thorough. Thank, thanks, Morag. Um, and just for some of the listeners as well, a lot of the papers connected to Orgreave directly are actually embargoed until 2060, um, which I think tells its own story, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I'm hoping to live till 90. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, Matt, this, this, this was for you, really. Um, a lot of people know about the Orgreave campaign, I'm sure, that are listening tonight. Um, but for those who don't, um, you know, have a look at in the chat. There's some links to our pages. Or just Google the images from what happened that day or the footage. It's not as if this stuff was hidden. It's quite there for people to see, you know, the brutality was pretty horrendous. And, in fact, some of the solicitors and lawyers who eventually got to see the miners that day were amazed that nobody were actually killed with the injuries that people... Um, Sustained. So I suppose a big question, Matt, is how do, on earth do these people get away with this stuff when it's so clearly documented? Have you have you got any ideas or, or thoughts on that? How 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 can this keep happening and and how do they get away with this? 
Yeah, I think there's a couple of things there, really. I mean, one is that they completely distort the, nar the narrative from the outset. Uh, there's a police briefing that goes out very quickly after these events, uh, whether they're planned or, or not, the events. There's a very quickly a police narrative goes out, and um, that's often repeated by, by, by the media. Um, not all of the media, sometimes there are, there are sections that, 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 that find out and hold to the truth. But, I mean, obviously, the, the famous story with Orgreave is that the, the BBC reversed the footage and had the horses, uh, the police horses going in after the, the miners had thrown stuff, and, and when, in fact, it was the other way around. So that's one of them. That didn't help the truth to come out. Uh, uh, and they didn't apologise. They wouldn't even apologise for years, really. I mean, and, and when they did apologise, it was a very uh, mealy-mouthed apology. Yeah. But the, I think the other thing is that they're just not held to account. So it, it, that's why the Orgreave, your campaign is so important, the, 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 the Orgreave Truth and Justice campaign, because it's if they were held to account there, we have a proper inquiry and the truth was, was aired and there was a public finding on the thing, just like, you know, like Hillsborough or whatever, um, it's impossible to to argue that the police should have more powers as they try and do under the police bill because of the, because of the abuse that's happened in the past, but because they go from one to the other, covering up and not being held to account, and they get away with it. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how that's happened um, outside of Orgreave. In the poll tax protest, um, the, the, there were questions about the police behaviour that Thatcher was aware, made aware of from her um, uh, permanent secretary at the time, so there was problems with the policing, but we but, and so it was put off for a review, and there were people like Tony Benn and Jeremy Corbyn saying, "No, we need a public inquiry, so it's all out in the open." Put off for a year later, exactly a year later, a review reports to the public, but even then, it's a summary, so we've never seen the full review of exactly what the police think went wrong on that day. We've, we've only got a summary, and I'm fascinated. One day we could hopefully get that full report that went to the Home Office, but didn't go to the public. And then if you, another one in the 90s, in 94, the, the, the protest against the Criminal Justice Act at, in Hyde Park, um, I mean, it was utter shambles, the, the uh, policing that day, a complete and utter shambles. Um, I think the commander who was in charge was completely out of his depth, hadn't done anything like this before. Uh, they said, of course, they blame the protesters for all the violence and all that sort of stuff. But the, what's come out more recently, which was an absolutely wonderful document to have a look at when I we was doing this for the book, was a, uh, a, a separate commander was asked to report on what went wrong that day. And at the beginning of the referral that he's given by a more senior officers, it says, this will not be made public. This is just mm -hmm. for us. So they actually need to know what they did wrong in order that they can learn. But they don't want us to know. Yeah. what went wrong. So reading that document, everything that I thought was happening that day that was going wrong is confirmed <laughs> of all the shambolic things they did and shouldn't have done. And it's a very, um, the, the, it's, it's a very, very, very critical document of the senior policing that day, of the senior officers and what they did wrong to help uh, exact, cause and exacerbate the violence. But of course, it was kept quiet until someone else, not me, but somebody else, not us, did, a, did an FOI request and got that document years later. Um, and so it was lovely to find that to fit into this book and to show they don't tell the truth and they're not held to account. That's why they get away with it. And that, I'll just repeat, is why the Augury thing is so important, because if we can get an inquiry, it... it it questions everything that follows, you know. It means the next one. They can't just say, oh, yeah, this is what happens. The, the protests are violent. They, they're held to account in a much more, well, isn't this the same as all grief? Exactly. <laughs> you know, that would be the, the instant reaction. Yeah. And that's why we've got to keep fighting uh, to, to win that battle, which I'm sure we can. I think um, I think you're dead right. And I think the Hillsborough campaign has been so determined, haven't they? And... You know, they might not have got the justice that they want, but I think one of the biggest forms of justice we can have is actually finding the truth and people knowing the truth. Um, being a football fan myself, it's so depressing, you know, 10, 15 years ago to hear Barnsley fans and other fans saying, well, you know what the Liverpool fans are like? Maybe they did do some of the things that were said. Maybe they did, they did drink. Maybe they did turn up late. And then when the truth comes out, you know, you see, you know, grown men saying, I can't believe I believed them. 
can't believe I've repeated them lines. And I think, you know, one of the things about fighting for justice is changing that narrative and having our own narrative believed. And I think that's why we know we're so determined in our grief campaign and, and spurred on by but spurred on by the Hillsborough campaigners and their and their determination. And um Another great thing about the criminal justice bill um, demonstration you talk about, Matt, I remember the, uh, I think it was the Sun, um, the day afterwards um, said, same old renter mob um, that are on every demonstration. And it just made me laugh. I could just imagine these sort of hundred year old activists on Zimmer frames and stuff and, you know, causing mayhem down part lane. It's <laughs> as if it's the same group of people that appear every every six months or 12 months or something. So, yeah. Changing the narratives um, so important and reclaiming that narrative. I think, um, that, yeah, that's what. Sorry, Joe. That's one of the great things about the book is you know we were worried at the beginning. Matt particularly was worried at the beginning. They'd all be the same. It would be the same people. It would be the same things that happened with the police. And that's just really not proven to be true. Everyone is different, and there's different yeah. people each one. So it's um, or you know this, there is a core, but yeah. Yeah, and and you're so right as well. What you said earlier about um, when you're first on a demonstration that turns like that you think you're the first person ever to experience it don't you and you know it's your generation that suffered worse than the previous generation or whatever so you know bringing all this together is it's a fantastic way of educating us all I think of different movements different uh, generations uh, and the rest of it um so for this is a question for you both um having done all this fantastic research um what is the biggest surprise has, any, has anything surprised you I mean what's the um, have you learned anything yourselves or, are you, or were you just confirming what you already thought? Um, um, whoever wants to go first. I'll go first. I mean, I, I think I learned, I mean, it, you have to come into this with open eyes because you learn so much more and there was masses. I've learned. Was, there were loads of things that really surprised me and, and that were uh, both appalling and riveting at the same time. Yeah. You know? But the the thing that really moved me the most, I think, surprised me the most was was the was the what happened at Welling in 1993 on the anti-racist demo, where 60,000 people, there enormous protests, one of the biggest anti-racist protests in British history, and I was there. It was very very confusing, and also quite frustrating. The fallout. The police were just saying it's the protesters, and there was there was a lot of confusion. It's actually what happened. You know, how did this all start? And at the time, I sort of realised roughly what had happened as the story started to come out in small places, uh, but the the overall narrative was was held by the police, really. Yeah. But when I went into that, I found those the element of what went wrong that day, where I, mean, I don't want to go into too much detail, but people can read so people can read it. But there was a whole other aspect to the case which I had not expected, which was that the three officers in charge that day. Uh, Commissioner Condon, Deputy Commissioner Osland, and Commander Blenkin were all in, in parallel involved at the very same time in in trying essentially to cover up the failings of the police investigation in Stephen Lawrence. And the whole protest was about race against racist killings in the area. So they were policing the protest in a certain way, which was extremely dodgy and, and uh, uh, caused, in my view, totally caused the violence. But the at the same time, they had this other motive that they were doing terrible things with the Stephen Lawrence family at exactly the same time. And I didn't know that was coming. Uh, so we're going through the whole, the, the Stephen Lawrence, um, the, the McPherson report, it just so many references to these officers and so much criticism of these officers within the McPherson report was just um, chilling and appalling. Um, and so that was the thing that surprised me the most in the research we did. Yeah, I know that, it, that really um, sort of shocked me as well when I, when I read that chapter. Um, Maura, have you, have you, is, there, is there something you'd like to add to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, within, I think within every chapter, there was something that surprised us both and that we've learned about. Um, in that, but I think for me overall, it's the systemic nature and approach to suppressing protest, you know, and, the, and the, that involved the civil servants, the media, the courts, the police, the government, you know, right across the board. And in time, that meant that this violent policing of protest became normalised. And it was really when you suddenly realised that actually this is 
normal behavior for them. Mm. That's quite shocking. And the reason it's doubly shocking is because when they, they were celebrating the launch of the manual in 1983 at a party, mm. the Home Secretary said that he wanted normal policing as the preferred tactic. Mm. And they've kind of got that because they think it's normal, even though it's not. So there's, it, it's come to that kind of um, got to that point that, you know, the government encouraged the police so much and, and they broke this uh, line that is meant to exist between independent, so independent operational policing and the government doing policy. You know, that, that was completely smashed. But uh, yeah, the normalization is, I think, the most frightening and uh, thing and the thing that surprised me the most. Yeah, from um, from sort of my early memories, um, one of my first demonstrations I went on, um, independently. <laughs> I'll not mention my parents because that gets a mention in the book. <laughs> <laughs> but without my parents, Boswelling, um, you know, and that was a, a scary demonstration. I think even for like hardened protesters, the violence that were meted out at that, and the fact that you were trapped, um, you know, there was no way to, to go, really. You had to either like, push forward and get beaten up by the police or you were trapped at the back wondering wondering what was happening, um, what was what, what terrifying. And then, you know, that went on through the 90s with the criminal justice bill stuff and the other anti-fascist protests that happened in the 90s. But then what I saw as an activist start to change, which is shocking because it was under, under Labour and we all thought that we'd hoped, all thought and hoped that things would change is that before demonstrations, so before big demonstrations would take place, not afterwards, the media would start to set the narrative. So around the anti-capitalist movement, around the May Day demonstrations, you know, for a week or two before, they'd start to publish stories saying, oh, there's going to be a violent crowd coming. You know, so it was almost predicting that there was going to be trouble. And then they could easily point the finger and say, ah, we told you so, it's them lot again, sort of thing. And I think that gave an atmosphere of encouragement to the police uh, as well to behave in the way that, that they did and, and, and able to also sell the, some of the newer tactics like Kettling, et cetera, to the public. And so the public weren't so outraged by that. Um, so I'm sort of building you up to the question. Here. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on the Labour Party and their role in, in policing? Um, obviously, we, we've talked about some of those things in the 80s and 90s, but as we move into sort of late 90s and 2000s, what role did the Labour Party play? Did things get better? Did they get worse? Uh, could Labour have intervened and done more to try and facilitate peaceful protest? Um, what did the book uh, and your research learn you about that sort of period of time? And I've got that down for you both again as well. So maybe Matt again this time. Sure. I mean, I think the there are sections of the Labour Party that come out of this very well. I mean, we, partly we wouldn't be able to tell this story in the way we could without the role that Tony Benn did of putting part of the, the the manual and that discussion into the into the House of Commons Library, so it's got permanent access, and um, certainly the role of um, people like Jeremy Corbyn calling for an inquiry after the poll tax was was absolutely was absolutely right, and uh, after the CJA protest at which he was present, um, but the, the the general position of the uh, of the um, uh, leadership of the party um, has been has been appalling. I mean, the, the, the poll tax protest, the Labour Party officially said we're not supporting this protest. There were 200,000 people there <laughs> of all, you know, ages and from all, you know, all sorts of weird different groups against the poll tax, and they couldn't bring themselves to support the, the, the protest at all. Mm. Um, and the fallout of that protest was the end of Thatcher, and, and Kinnock went up 23 points in the after that protest. So they benefited from it, but they didn't support it. But the Tony Blair's role was was an enigma at the time. Nobody knew really what he stood for. But once he once he got into office, I think he gave ACPO absolutely everything they wanted. So they got there was a criminal law brought in for every day they were in office. Just vast swathes of legislation. Uh, including things like the ASBO, which gave them massive discretionary powers and led to lots of people going to prison who were very young or had mental health problems or whatever. Um, so, uh, and that they were empowered under Blair to go further. And as Morag said earlier, that, that led them to even go beyond the manual and to introduce kettling, uh, where um, I remember my sister was 
was caught up in one of the student kettles in 2010, seven hours in the freezing cold, no access to a toilet, no access to water, no access to food. And what that does undoubtedly is, is make people not want to come back, yeah. which is why they do it. Yeah. You know, there were, there were thousands of people on those protests, but it's a chilling effect. If you go to a protest, you're just going to be surrounded by police and you can't leave. And it's, and it, 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 in fact, that's why it was invented to bore you into submission. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so we dealt with that in great detail in the book about how the, how the ke where the kettling came from and how they try and justify it. But that that's all come under labour. So so it's a it's a story where they almost always support the police, the, the the leadership of the Labour Party after these protests, and then ask questions after. It's not completely uniform. Mm. So I mean, there are odd quotes in the book that, that may surprise people. Uh, David Lammy criticising uh, Kettling uh, after the student protest and a fantastic quote from uh, from the mayor, which I won't talk about because of my favourite quote in the book. But the so it, it's not one just one linear thing across the board, but the general thrust has been to to give the police more power against protesters. They were even going to, weren't they, famously going to abstain on this lease recent bill which is just um unbelievable i mean completely unbelievable that the the last point i make is that the shadow shadow cabinet awash with human rights barristers uh can't bring it so you know been boring us to death about human rights with books and lectures that i had to go to from 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 care uh, when it comes to a massive attack on human rights um can't bring themselves to oppose it Mm. Uh, I mean, you couldn't have a bigger, you know, bigger attack than the than the police bill. Mm. Um, mm. So it's a it's it's not made any difference essentially what what government we've had in terms of how the how far the police have gone. Mm. Morag, would you like to talk about this, the state of the Labour Party and sure. <laughs> and where we are? Yeah, the kind of the end of the miners' strike. Um, Gordon Brown and Mervyn Rees. Um, did do a report on the miners strike which is actually quite revealing but i don't know if, i don't think it went anywhere mm. um number one but later on uh kind of 2005 during the g8 summit which was held uh Glen Eagles, scotland which is about 30 miles outside of edinburgh and um, we had both um a labor party executive so they were the party of power in the scottish uh, executive at the time before it became a government and then we had uk labor um, at Westminster as well. Now they, um, first of all, they, they moved the G8 to a very rural countryside area, which was very difficult to access. So they couldn't be heard by protesters. They put a big fence around it five miles you know, away from the thing. So literally separated the protesters from, from the people having the summit and unable to hear them. There was lots of uh, discussion about what kind of protests could be had. Um, but kind of one of the more sinister aspects of that, it was the largest gathering of undercover cops um, that is known of in Britain. Um, plus they had eight cops from Germany, undercover cops um, in uh, there as well. And they were um, managed by ACPO again, but particularly someone from ACPO Scotland. And it was only a year later that um, the rules of ACPO were changed to cover kind of such strategic items. And then it was only another um, in 2013 that then ACPO changed the rules again, to, their rules again to cover Scotland. So we wonder if that was done retrospectively to make them compliant. Um, but but in, in terms of when Mark Kennedy, who was one of the, um, uh, one of the spy cops or Flash Stone, I think he was known as, um, he um, said that he had been told by his senior officer on a number of occasions that all of the information that they were gathering went directly to Tony Blair, particularly during the G8. Um, and then I also must, um, sorry, miss, uh, just remembered something that, you know, even though they moved this rural, um, to this rural location, protesters became very creative and hid in the forest and then jumped out onto the road and blocked the road. And then um, the police, they were kind of playing cat and mice with the police and the protesters did manage, or it's little reported, but they did manage to block all the roads to Glen Eagles to, you know, and almost stop the, the conference. So, you know, that kind of, 
creativity um, was quite good. But yeah, his spy cops were reporting back. A lot of people got arrested even before they got to the demo. You know, they got off the train and on the drive to um, the camp, the the uh, camp where everyone was staying, they were stopped and very draconian, as we've seen in many demonstrations. Um, uh, bail conditions, which meant they couldn't even go back and get their bags without breaching their bail in some cases. So, and then some of them were re-arrested. So yeah, that's um, the alarm. I'll yeah. stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was going to um, just do one do one more question and then encourage um, people listening to put their questions into the uh, into the chat so we can read them out and get Matt and uh, Morag to answer people's questions rather than just listening to me uh, bang on, even though I would listen to myself all night, of course. Um, so the last thing I'm going to bring up before we get um, people to post their questions in and read them out is there's, um, along with a raft of... Um, laws and, and tactics used to suppress protest. Have you got any thoughts about these new suggestions around curbing the right to strike and bringing in agency workers? Um, I think, you know, next week, if the RMT strike comes off, it's going to be one of the biggest pieces of industrial action we've seen in this country for years. And again, uh, the media are already cranking things up. If you look at the headlines of it last, you know, week or 10 days, nothing's off the table to crush action talking about bringing agency workers into break strikes, all the ramifications of that. Um, of course, tied up with the recent legislation that everyone's touched on tonight about the police bill and the new proposed legislation. You know, but are we doomed? Is the future of protests looking grim? Or have you got a, have you got a sort of a positive outlook that you can look back on and where we've overturned these laws before or defied them? What are your thoughts on that? And obviously, people listening, if you've got your own thoughts and questions on that, we'd be really um, keen to hear them so we can read them out as well. So, yeah, please post your questions in and I'll pass you over to Maura. Yeah, I'll go first. Um, so, yeah, I think in terms of one of the things that we've seen throughout the book is that the solidarity, you know, really works, whether that's welling, poll tax, or more recently, Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, the schools walkouts, etc. Even last night with the Rwanda um, deportations, you know, it, it gives voice to people and it gives strength, etc. So it gets an issue on the agenda uh, to discuss it. You know, particularly BLM showed us that history is only told from one side and you know and that has been completely changed so yes it absolutely works <laughs> in, ter <laughs> in terms of um you know these new agency um worker rules potentially you know that actually has also been seen before um at Wapping you know Rupert Murdoch created a whole new workforce um before he he moved you know opened his plant and sacked 5,500 workers overnight, you know, from cleaners all the way through to the printers. You know, so it, it they that's been done before. And I think now, you know, uh, we're more, at least with various things going on, we're more aware that that's what's coming down the line. So we need to do that. Pickets and protesters need to be very aware of what's coming. Um, one of the interesting things that they, they've done in the past, and I'm sure you know, Joe, is that secondary picketing is already banned. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I find it very curious um, that we're not allowed to do secondary picketing, but the police can move police forces from, for example, the Met up to Manchester or, up, you know, up to Scotland even mm -hmm. nowadays. Um, and you know, why is that not secondary picketing? So it's so unequal um, in terms of, you know, what workers are allowed to do and what the state and the police um, can do. And that inequity, I think, needs to be called out more. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, Matt, I don't know if you want to... No, I can't yeah. answer to that. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Morag. I think, yeah, um, yeah, the, the message is we've just got to keep on fighting, isn't it? And, and not give up. And, and no matter what they throw at us, we we managed to find uh, find a way around it. Um, uh, we've got some... Sorry, yeah, go on. that's one of the great things about the RMT strike. You know, personally, I'm affected, but like so what? <laughs> because, you know, it, how, what are they going to do? It's all around the country nationally. It's yeah. just going to be incredible if it, come, if it happens. Yeah. We're getting some great questions coming in now. Um, Tony's Tony's question was first, but I think you might have touched on that. Um, do you think we're going to see attack on the rail unions like Thatcher did against the miners? 
Um, I don't know if you want to answer that one directly or do you think we've touched on touched um, that one enough? Well, I, I would just say that my personal view is that I think the government are setting up a fight with the unions because they're refusing to discuss or negotiate with the unions at all. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, the six page, you know, a six and a half page document that was put out about re redoing the food and agriculture thing. You know, they didn't speak to one worker. They didn't speak to one trade union in relation to that new policy. So I think that they're setting up. I think they're going for a fight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I, I think it's on a, important on that level. I saw the PMQs today and, and Johnson was talking about the union barons and he was very much leading on the RMT uh, issue, which Dharma was in incredibly weak on. Um, I'd say there are a couple of differences, I and mean, I don't think they've prepared in the same way as they did for the miners, where they prepared over a year and stockpiles and stuff like that. They certainly want to take on the strongest union. Um, it seems to me the vote was very high for the strike action, and I think the action could be very strong and very powerful. Mm. Um, we're also in a period where everybody is affected by a cost of living crisis. And it, it's very much up in the air, isn't it? Because I think there, there could be a lot of support for the RMT and everyone's going to be looking at it. Because if they win, uh, I mean, everybody wants uh, is struggling. Um, and and they, it, it seems absolutely crucial to get sort of support groups going and and to get down to the picket lines and, and to and to give whatever support we can to you know it's, to all the station staff and all that sort of stuff. So they they keep putting out it's about rich drivers, but it's actually also it, and they've it, that's not true in, in in a wider sense. We know that, but it's it's about all the support staff who, who are actually very very badly paid, and it's it's about safety. And we we all know that you go on the tube as we do late at night. There's no one around. And it's and it's uh, not safe no. as it is. So if they're going to make more cuts, it's going to be there's going to obviously have a massive knock-on effect of, of uh, you know more people unprotected, particularly women. Uh, you know it, it's um, it's a fight for everyone, and I think um, I, I think it's the government are, are much weaker than Thatcher was in eight, 84. They're, they're, you know, they're literally, they've got, they've got a leader who, um, I just saw today that the ethics advisor has resigned today. Uh, Johnson's ethics advisor, he can't, he can't live with this anymore. So he, he, he's hated by his own party. And so if we can get some action together and it's supported, it could, it could easily cause them a problem. And uh, these by-elections coming up. So I'm, I'm quite um, optimistic about it, really. Yeah, I, I, I've been quite enjoying arguing with people recently when they say, oh, you unionised people, you're already well paid. I'm saying, what, is that an argument against being in the union or for it? I can't quite understand. <laughs> you know, so they're saying, yeah, join a union, you get better pay, you know. it's. Um, it's just, I'll never forget with uh, it's Bob Crow was on... Bob Crow was on Newsnight and they did that to him. They brought up a graph of how many, how much money the train drivers uh, earn and, and how they earn a lot more than... Uh, uh, than the average um, worker, and he just said, "That's that's fantastic. We're doing a great job. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank absolutely. you for putting that chart up." And there was absolutely nothing they could say. Sometimes they um, they argue against themselves without even realizing it, don't they? Um, yeah, it's fantastic. And um, this is a great question from Jane. Um, do you have any thoughts on? <clears throat> excuse me. Do you have any thoughts on how tech and social media are used now to police protests? Mm. I guess um, Jane's thinking about you know the the positives of social media you know our messages can get out there very fast but also i'm guessing that um we all know that the police and their allies use social media to to pinpoint troublemakers etc after demonstrations um what what are your thoughts on, on that more um, oh, oh, Matt, Matt's gonna go. yeah i'll have a go and i'm not sure of the technicalities in the new police bill i'm afraid on this there is stuff on it but the, the the general thrust of this has been happening for years and there's this frightening thing of where they just started filming protests in the 90s uh or north yeah more than nine to end of the 90s noughties and you'd just be on a protest and you'd be suddenly be filmed by an evidence gatherer because you might commit an offense yeah. and then they piece together all the footage 
in a, in a separate um, office and put together a narrative around the way that they've cut the footage. And having done, represented lots of people from the student protests, uh, more often than not, the narrative is incorrect and you have to go and find your own footage to contradict it, but it, can, it is usually contradicted by a wider, by a wider context. So that ability to abuse uh, through resources, yeah. uh, the narrative is a very frightening one. Uh, when you're especially on legal aid where there isn't you're not paid to look at unused material uh, often you're relying on you know sometimes family members or you know paralegals and things to to, to go the extra mile and find stuff um, I think the other thing that's a real worry which I think may be part of the new provisions but it's sort of been around for a while is that they tend to sort of like to grab people's phones and download them as soon as they can and the legality of that is 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 a bit dubious I mm -hmm. think uh, and that can have all sorts of um, uh, attack on sort of right to the private individual about other things and, and stuff like that in terms of intelligence gathering. So I think it's, and we we on our side we can film things. We have to be careful how we how we film things and how we put things out there. I think at times and yeah. implicate people who don't need to be implicated, etc. But generally, um, it can cut both ways, as you said in the question. I, th I think I think you're right, Matt. I think we need to be all very aware of that when we're on on protests, how how it can be used against us. Um, and there's a really interesting chapter in the book, actually, where that's talked about, isn't there? About a narrative that the police tried to build, uh, which I won't talk about too much. I want everyone to buy the book and not not spoil it. Um, interesting point in the chat. You can... Oh, sorry, is there some chat there? I've got my um, question and answers bit open. Is this about um, Unite Community and secondary picketing? Yeah, so, um, and the next one as well, that when disabled activists protest, the police send the footage and names to the DWP. Oh, wow, right, yeah. Thanks for pointing that out, Tony. That's that's really important. And, yeah, um, the, secondary, the secondary picketing stuff, I don't know if you want to answer that, Marag, or... Well, no, just, do, you want me to, do you want me to come in on that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll sort of abuse the chair and, and yeah. my position in, in, in as, a, as a trade union organiser. Um, yeah, um, it's not just community members, obviously, but the wider movement can support workers in dispute and take action uh, to support workers in dispute that the workers themselves can't do because of legal reasons. Um, so, yeah, if people are out there and they want to support the rail workers... Uh, and up all the other disputes that are happening and, um, you know, get down to the picket line, speak to the shop stewards and find out what support they need. Because as we all know, the, the, the trade union laws are so restrictive now, it stops us from doing what we want. Um, but the wider community and support people can can carry out their actions, definitely. So thanks for putting that in the chat. Tony, I think, put that in. Thank, thanks, Tony. And obviously is, is warning about... Um, how the police can report people to the DWP and obviously report other workers to their workplace, workplaces as well is, is something to be something to be aware of, definitely. Uh, Pete, we haven't got much long left, but we'll um, we'll skip through because there's two really good ones left. And then we'll uh, and then th think we'll wrap up then. Um, Peter's coming again about the Labour Party leadership. It's been a theme of tonight's discussion. Well, um, I live in Scotland, Joe, so I'm, I've got my <laughs> opposition. You know, I would say move to Scotland. Move to Scotland, that's a great answer, yeah. I wish we all could sometimes. <laughs> um, um, yeah, just to think. answer that one, uh, Joe, I mean, yeah, I, I yeah. think one answer... Should, is... should, we, it, should we try and look for an alternative um, opposition is, is the thrust of the question, and I don't know what people's thoughts on that are. I think one answer is if you look at the Poltat story, um, which was a wonderful um, campaign across the country and, and, and in Scotland as well, you know, particularly in Scotland, that was all organised um, pretty much independently. Well, certainly independently of the Labour leadership. You know, there were local anti poll tax groups, one on estates and in unions. And, 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 and so I think there is, we don't have to be held back by the fact that, um, that Starm is so pathetic on on some of these issues. I think that the, the ability to organise independently, uh, locally through unions, etc. There are plenty of examples in in this story of, of people doing that. And I think that's if the RMT struggle goes on for a while, I think we could quite easily do that quite quickly um, yeah. in our localities. <laughs> And the nature yeah. of government, they, 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 and opposition, they then spring to 
what's pop, what they think is popular. So if, if they can't do anything else but see that support for the RMT and others is popular, then hopefully mm. they'll eventually move that way themselves. I think I think that's the way to go. You know, if when we start winning, people want to join us. You know, and it, 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 there's nothing better than a victory to encourage other people. So. You know, support the strikes in your local area, and obviously the the RMT strike is going to be massive. But there's an absolute wave of industrial action happening right across private sector as well at the minute. So get out there and get on the picket lines, and you know, people will follow once we start to win. There's there's no truer truer saying than that. Mm -hmm. Um, Sally's got a great question. Um, she said, "What I'm interested to understand from both of you what impact you hope hope to make um, from writing the book." Um, is it, is it, did you expect to make a particular impact or are you waiting to see that is there going to be some unexpected sort of, you know, follow-ups from this? I suppose there are a couple of things on it. I mean, part of it is what we were talking about before to, to raise education amongst, amongst the movement, if I can put it that way, so that people are aware of what happened before and they're better educated in order to fight the battles that they're going to have against the police. But I think also specific things, um, like the Orgreave thing, this is, book is definitely written to support, there's a chapter on Orgreave to support that, that we get an inquiry, and I think we can win an inquiry, um, to stop the police bill. Uh, that, that's going to be difficult, but even if we don't stop it, the, 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 the narrative is that it, it's immoral and, and is not, there's no evidence base for it, given the book. Uh, there's another specific thing that I would like to come out of the book, which is that there's a family who were in the student protest who who were uh, went through the whole criminal the whole criminal justice process and then came out the other side and then won a civil action. And I personally would like to obtain a for them a, a apology from David Cameron who who told a terrible lie the day after that protest and that needs to be corrected. Uh, and uh, I think following the Greensill uh, uh, scandal that he was involved in of um, you know, sort of lining his pockets with someone who was previously connected with his government, um, I think we could get there with the right, with the right sort of campaign and, and, and uh, pressure. So I think there are lots of, lots of things, but the, the most important thing I think is that people are educated and know, know what happened at, to the miners so that they can say to the police, no, you've done this before, you're not doing it again, that sort of thing. I think that's the most important impact I, I would like to see, or we would like to see, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have nothing to add to that. So. That's a brilliant answer, yeah, I was just about to say that. And then the last one, again from Peter, is, um, you know, with such a well-resourced police force that seems to be so keen to clamp down on protest, do we need to develop more sophisticated forms of protesting? I think we sort of touched on this at the beginning a bit and like learn the lessons and not repeat um, common mistakes. I think that's a good question, Peter. I don't know if Maura or Matt can sum up briefly on that one and, and then we'll go to summing up, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll just do a little bit and then I'll hand over to Matt. But I think that there's two things. One is, you know, be aware of what's going on, become more creative, you know, um, et cetera. And Joe and I have spoken about that quite a lot in the mm -hmm. past is, you know, more creative um, protesting. But, you know, also we really need to, as we've said already, start holding the police and the government to account and then know, you know, know your rights when you're there. Because what we've also, what I've seen in the book, but, you know, particularly in the G8 and some of the other protests is um, because people don't know what their rights are, they kind of, tell the police too much, you know, names and addresses, et cetera, et cetera. So be aware of that as well. Um, but I'll, I'll hand over to Matt and the forms of protest or anything else he has. Yeah, I mean, it is, um, it's very frightening where we've got to because the police have been given vast discretion under the bill that's been passed and they want to give more under the one that, that's in the process of going through, through um, Parliament. But they can now control, uh, they could effectively stop uh, noisy protest, the length of the protest, they can make protests short, they can make protests quiet by stopping noisy protests, and they can stop protests that they consider to be um, seriously annoying or causing, causing serious annoyance. So there's this vast discretion and how that's going to play out. We know from the way that they treated the Sarah Everard vigil that they're not going to use their discretion wisely or cautiously, they're going to use it in excess. But I I think with new forms of protest will inevitably 
come to light because they always do. But I also think numbers are crucial. You know, where you have vast, um, big turnouts, uh, even locally uh, or nationally, it's much harder for the police to sort of rely on the, any of the laws that they, all the powers they've been given uh, in, a, in a moral case. So I'm not, I'm not saying there's no danger there and you don't have to be aware of the legalities, but um, what happened at Saltley Gates was that they just closed the gates because they couldn't police it uh, because it was so big. It was 30,000 people turned up in the north of Birmingham to, to, to support that, um, that action. So I'm absolutely convinced that the, the more um, pressure there is on social society with the cost of living, et cetera, that the more at, at times there'll be explosions of, 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 of massive reaction to things. I mean, even the, the reaction to the Rwanda thing was fantastic the other night. Those things, you can't just put a lid on this thing and tell people you have to go away and shut up. It's just not going to work. Um, but we are going to have to think. I mean, I think Peter's question is a very good question. We are obviously going to have to be aware of what the wider process is and how we argue around it and what argument we're um, we're putting forward to say that, that, that the use of the criminal law is not justified in that case. Yeah, and um, obviously uh, abusing the chair again. Anybody who does fall victim to these new laws, they need you know maximum support from us all, don't they? Um, yeah. um, I'm sure there's going to be some test cases coming up in yeah. in the coming weeks and months. Not that I want to be a martyr, by the way, but um, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure someone is going to fall foul of that, and then we need to fall, put the full weight of our movement behind that and making sure that they, they they get the justice that they they deserve and unfortunately that's gone really fast which means it's been a good talk um but it does bring us to a to a, a sort of a close um, i'm hoping um that the chat will be able to post in some links for us at this point because there's a bit of a large demonstration i hear happening on saturday in london i'm sure that there'll be a lot of people attending there and i'm hoping that the links to that tuc demonstration around the cost of living will appear in the chat any second now while we're talking. Um, for those of you who can't uh, make it to London, um, but live in the north of England, you may want to come and support the All Grief Truth and Justice campaign um, because the 18th of June is the anniversary of All Grief. It's 38 years now um, since the police riot at All Grief, which we touched on earlier, and the links to our campaign and the rally will appear in the chat as well, hopefully, so you can follow us on social media but even better, come out on the streets and support us on Saturday in Sheffield at one o'clock. Most importantly, of course, you should all now be going online to um, buy this fantastic book. Stop, go away. Go on. Um, so if you haven't bought it already or, or read it before tonight's meeting, then I'd advise you, you do buy it. Um, I'm not the biggest reader, which my um, college lecturers will tell you about. If they're watching, they'll be joking, saying, I'm sure Joe's not actually read this but just looked at the pictures maybe, <laughs> but it is an absolutely fantastic book um, and it's dead easy to read. So if you haven't bought it, please buy it. And even better, if you have bought it already, then post about it on social media, tagging Matt and, uh, and Morag. And maybe you could even ask your local book st uh, bookstore to stock it as well. I think that'd be another fantastic action you can, action you can do. And if you're in a union uh, branch or a community uh, branch you could you know raise it with your colleagues as well and and your fellow activists and get them to read it and um, so yeah please support the book please support the march on saturday don't be scared about these new laws get out there on the streets and keep fighting and campaigning because that's how we we're going to win and of course um i want to finish off with the immortal words of bob crow um i think which matt were just touching on there and i think one of my favorite quotes from bob was that if we all spat together we'd drown them <laughs> Um, 